Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to a September 19th edition of the MSP Initiative, MSP Talk. We took a day off this week. We were on the road and back in front of a computer and can you now continue on. So uh, we're going to get some housekeeping done, which is what we do at the beginning of every one of these sessions, as you know, and then we'll get into uh, the good stuff. So mspinitiative.com. Here you'll find everything that we like to post all in one place, including this session, which is being recorded. And we will post it under the sessions page, our YouTube page, our podcatcher page, our LinkedIn page, everywhere where we can post it. Uh, but it is under sessions on mspinitiative.com. You can like, forward, download, subscribe. Uh, you know what to do there. Next week, finally, we are here, September 25th and 26th in Denver area. We are hosting MSP Community Minds, our second educational event of the year. You'll see this is a two-day event packed with um, panels in the morning and workshops in the afternoon. You'll find our one, two, three, four MSP panels and eight uh, workshops. You know, the, the panels you know, are kind of like an open forum and we bring MSPs from around the industry to talk on various topics and the workshops are targeted based to the, you know, speaker and what their, you know, genre is, if you would. And they do a two hour session each time, twice, most of the time. Uh, so that various topics that they cover. This event is absolutely 100% free as an MSP to attend and register to attend. Obviously you have to get there. We understand that takes a little bit of time, and a little bit of money. So, uh, if you're interested in joining us next week in Denver, September 25th, 26th, uh, go to mspinitiative.com, go to Community Minds, all the information's there and how to register. Again, there's no $399, $999, $1299 registration fee. It is absolutely free for an MSP to come and attend. Yes, we cover food, entertainment, education. You just got to get there. So check it out. Then, of course, what people probably know is better for is the msp community block parties there are four four between now and the end of the year let's do it if you are headed to pax 8 beyond in berlin in germany yeah that's right it's another country october 14th at 9 p.m we are holding our first ever block party in berlin there's a very beer theme we're going to the brew dog dog tap this brewery and it's huge and you'll love it and a very Oktoberfest theme even though Oktoberfest actually ends in September if you actually looked it up I know it's weird Germans uh so uh check it out uh Pax AP on Berlin block party again October 13th we'll be there if you're gonna be there jump in for the fun then we're headed to that kind of my Miami South Beach so we're going to the Fountain Blue okay on October 29th 9.30 on property. The door of the venue where the conference is happening. So meet us there at Datocom Miami on South Beach. And that one is on, again, October 20th. Sorry, October 29th. Then we're going to the big one. IT Nation Connect in Orlando. And if you haven't been paying attention on our social media, this is the one where we have the huge, big announce, you know, like act, you know, like something, somebody that you've heard on the radio or in a music video or on your Spotify feed. feed. And this year, that uh, entertainer is Flo Rider. Gotta be in the greater Orlando area, or you happen to be going to IT Nation. No requirement, by the way, for any of these for you to be going to the respective conferences. We would love to see you there, but these are for the community. So if you just happen to be in the area, you, you can join us. We will be doing this one on the first night of IT Nation in Orlando on November 6th. Again, if you're an MSP, absolutely nothing, no cost other than you need to sign up and provide some information for you to join us. So free uh, entertainment and concert and block party for the community in Orlando. We close out our year in Sydney at Datocon Sydney. So if you happen to be going down under, which it's like fall, winter time, it's spring, summertime over there. Who would have thought? So if you get your swimming shorts on, jump on a plane, 24, 24 hours later, you'll end up probably in Sydney, Australia on November 12th. And um, at 8.30 p.m., we'll be doing a hour block party, an after party at uh, in Sydney, in Darling Harbor. So there they all are. Lots of entertainment for the whole community. Absolutely no cost for you to join us at any of these things. They're for you, the MSP. 
There's some industry offers that you might want to take advantage of on the community offers page. And then the industry calendar goes all the way until the end of the year. And then we start all over again uh, in 2025. So there are uh, lots of stuff going on. And uh, hopefully you will be able to, uh-oh. I am not sure what happened. <laughs> I think we I think we lost George. We lost George. I'm, I'm still here for entertainment purposes. <laughs> <laughs> all I heard all I heard is uh oh, and then everything just dropped. <laughs> <laughs> so you are you are now the new host there. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> you you gotta you gotta finish the pitch, Jen. This is this, this is the backup here. You're you're know, you're live I'm broadcasting. Gonna you gotta you gotta get this through. This is I mean, I guess while we have you on here, you are coming to community minds. Yes. It is in less than a week, which is going to be really exciting. And did you know that as a vendor, you can attend the workshops yourself as well? What if they don't want me in the workshops? I'm they really do. loud. They want you there. <laughs> They, the louder, the better, actually. <laughs> I usually say, uh, don't invite the Adam guy back. I mean, I've got our unicorn shirts and uh, we, we make a lot of noise and we ask a lot of dumb questions. <laughs> oh, then this is perfect because they're super interactive. They want people talking. So, oh my God. Now he's like in the red he's room. He's in the red room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Technical difficulties. I'm working on it. But anyway, without further ado we bring on our special guest for today which is from humanize it which i think has not been on the show before so nope. we bring on adam walter and adam while i'm trying to uh you know fix all of the blinking lights on my computer screen why don't you go ahead and give us a little bit of uh, an introduction and some background yeah sure my, my name is adam walter for those of you who don't know me uh I'm the host of the uh, podcast, Humanize IT. Um, and you'll see my face on reels and everywhere all over the place. We love our unicorns. But I was an engineer for 17 years. I rose through the ranks, CISSP. I published at SANS. I got some paper around uh, streamlined, streamlined application security out there somewhere. Uh, I got tired of the corporate world and decided to start my own business doing CIO work for small businesses. I didn't know what VCIO was. I just knew that these companies I was working with needed um, some advice. So I started working there. Eventually, I start, got asked to start coaching MSPs on how to do this. So I took my gap analysis tool, managed services platform, and I started helping MSPs understand how to assess a client's needs from a business standpoint and translate that into technology. In 2021, I bought the gap tool from my partner and I turned it into what was now called Humanize IT, named after my podcast, which will allow you to talk tech sales and business with a client without actually having to go through huge processes. We just released a product recently called Automated Assessments, where we'll take a gap analysis uh, of picture of your asset inventory and give you a project list so you know what to talk to your clients about. But keep that conversation business focused. Our, our claim to fame here is we are an independent vendor, 100%. We are self-owned. We did not come from a big sale. We came in and bootstrapped this whole thing. Everything we have developed has been because MSPs wanted it. It was something, a feature they needed. And we really want to help drive MSPs to be more consultative and less break fix. Awesome. Well, that's interesting. So, so you came from the corporate red tape world. How, yeah, what made you want to come into MSP land? Burnout. <laughs> I, uh, Burnout. Okay. I, well, you know, as you rise through the ranks in the corporate world, you you get um, more and more process, more and more red tape, more and more less and less doing actual things that matter. Um, I ended my career with uh, doing policy generation for critical infrastructure as a director of security, and so. I realized that, man, there's only so many times you've been told, well, we're not going to do that security thing because no one else is doing it. And, you know, plausible deniability is a thing. And so you get a little frustrated there. And my wife's like, why don't you just start a company? I'm like, 
okay, I'll do consultative. I got the ego for it. <laughs> and so that's how I, that's how I came into this world. And I didn't know much about the MSP world. Again, I was a corporate guy. I was a Nexus core admin. Um, I was very good at engineering. I never saw myself as going to be a business owner. It just kind of life happens and you flow into things. And now I'm a software uh, as a service provider who does consulting. And then we, we had a little bit of a, a little bit of a, um, uh, a, a culture crisis here. And we're like, are we a coaching company or are we a software company? And we had to like redo our market branding because we're actually a coaching company that happens to have a tool. Every time you buy our software, we actually teach you how to talk to clients. We have a CIO, a VCIO entire curriculum built up to build a account management process from scratch so that you can actually evaluate your customers. We're all about teaching. Even if you don't get into our consulting packages, every piece of software we have comes with a consulting package where we will help you those first eight weeks and teach you and continue to teach throughout the years. In fact, this afternoon, we even have at the top of the hour here, our weekly community update where we talk about what you should be working on this week as an account manager. It's a 20 minute session. We run through an event calendar that you can see on our website that shows you like, hey, this week, you really need to be planning out those Q4 QBRs. October is the beginning of, QB of Q4. You should be talking to your clients about budgeting. You should be talking to your clients about what does 2025 look like? Because now is when they're building their budgets and the first person to the table is the first person to get paid. Okay, I'm about to flip 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 device. Ten seconds. You're good. You're good. I can I can talk all day. Anybody who's had me on their webinar knows that, that Adam Walter can fill time. If you're ever at a conference, like oh crap, we had somebody cancel. Um, their flight got delayed. Just go find Adam and say, hey, um, the topic is uh is um, codfish, or I need you to talk about this for twenty minutes. I got you covered. Ah, uh, all good. So. Let's be honest, right? And I argue this number, I feel like almost every day, definitely this week for sure. You know, like, let's say there's somebody's like, oh, there's 45,000 MSPs in North America. Somebody's like, there's 90. Somebody said 125, whatever. It's 70. Somewhere between, how, how much is it? it? It's 70. Don't you know? Come on, man. That, 70? No, it's like a, where does the dart hit? Okay. So, like, <laughs> so the majority of MSPs are sub 10 people, actually many sub five people. Obviously, there are very big ones, too, so don't want to mm -hmm. exclude them, but I'm just saying the vast majority. How many MSPs have you run to? I would think the majority are telling you, we don't even have the person in the dedicated chair of account manager. Well, I, I tell people, guess what? If you're a one-man shop, and I just told somebody this last hour, right, on a call. If you're a one-man shop, guess who the CEO is? If you're a one-man shop, guess who the HR director is? The CIO exists. It's who is wearing that hat. The account manager exists. Somebody is wearing that hat. Who is interfacing with your clients and making sure that you're delivering on time? It's probably the CEO until you hire somebody. Mm -hmm. And so we tell people like that person owns talking to the clients about what's making them profitable. And that's what a CIO is. A lot of people in the MSP industry have a have a misunderstanding of what a CIO is. And I think it's because you're wearing so many hats all at the same time that you confuse a director level employee with a C-level employee. C-levels care about profit and how the company is running. Mm -hmm. So in the early 2000s, uh, I'm going to show my age here. We didn't have any CIOs with technical backgrounds. They didn't exist. They were accountants, largely that got promoted into this new division called IT. And then they would come to us and go, hey, how are we making money? How are we saving money? And they were very focused on profit and loss. And then we as engineers had to learn how to speak like C <laughs> CFOs because I just want to fix the server over here. What, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, I can imagine that. So, okay. So how did, like, is there not a, if, the, if you're constantly taking one hat off and putting another hat on, when you go to sit down and have this strategic conversation, because that's yep. what this is, right? This is like, hey, let's get out of the day-to-day -day and let's like work on the business, not in the business kind of thing. Yep. 
are you know do you find that a lot of the people that you know you you work with in msp land they're just not being taken uh seriously correct because they're asking the wrong questions hey george let's let's change this webinar today and let's just talk about how you're collecting receipts for msp initiative Mm -hmm. We're going to really dive into um, how to upload receipts and talk about receipts and how to get them into your accounting system. And then mm -hmm. we're going to talk about cost center analysis and how to bucket each one of those items. I can already see you glazing over. It's important. It's something that needs to be done. But is that the, the number one priority for you today? Now, imagine if somebody came in every day and just said, I want to talk about receipts. I want to talk about receipts. Okay, you're going to put them into that bucket there. That is now your bucket. You are the receipt guy. You're the receipt girl. Mm -hmm. And that is all you are. And so technical people come in and they just talk about technology. Like, hey, you need to replace this PC. You need to upgrade this server. You need this new firewall. You need this new software. They're constantly talking technology. So they get put into this technology bucket. Mm -hmm. They are not strategic anymore. If I have a technology question, I'll come and ask you. If you change the narrative, you come and say, hey, company, can you tell me about yourself? What are you guys making money off of? What's causing you problems in that landscape? I want to learn about your business so that as technology comes up that may or may help you, may or may not help you, I can bring it to you. And I can say, oh my gosh, I just read an article about those exploding pagers last week. Um, does that going to affect your company? No, just so you know, that was a specific, you know, I can lay it out for them. You know, maybe they're concerned about that because they use pagers in their company. Or maybe a new technology comes out around chat GPT and they're really worried about people coming into their website and not getting customer service in off hours. Well, I'm now I'm gonna bring that up with you because we know that's a big revenue source for you. But if you don't understand your client, you can't solve these technology problems. You have 10,000 solutions in your head that you're right now trying to pick one or two randomly to talk to them about rather than sitting down and listening to them about what their problems are that you can solve through technology. Okay. It doesn't now, take a big that, that, switch to the conversation. The, the, you know, again, it, the, you know, technology is great, right? We always talk about technology as just yep. tools, right? Just tools, you know, like we're trying to solve other problems and we're just using technology as the way to get to a solution, right? Here's a problem. A lot of MSPs too busy in the day to day, getting underneath the desks, you know, throwing a cable across the drop ceiling when they shouldn't, right? To go plug something in, four port switch hanging in the closet. You know, I'm just tall, so I just weave it through the ceiling. It's a super yeah, that, I, I'm not. Trust me. And, you know, <laughs> like I'm the one who takes like all the whole drop ceiling thing down with me as I fall off the ladder. Right? <laughs> so, so my point to you is, um, in order to have effective conversations around strategic stuff, you need to do homework. And I feel like a lot of the conversations going into the meetings with the customers, the positioning with the customers, the planning sessions with the customers, you know, are just like, hey, you know, I, I know what I I know what I need in my head, but I'm not coming to show them anything. And I feel like that's where the, you know, disconnect is between, you know, a decision maker of your, you know, or you know, of your customer, right? Wh whatever type of customer they are, and you being the accountant, the HR guy, the CIO, the CEO, the front, the first line uh, help desk tech support, yep. and the person that answers the the phone when you know, you know it's it's Saturday night and and something's melting down. Yeah, and some of the best CIO level activity I have seen has come from level one technicians in the corporate world. Hmm. The people crawling under the desks. And the way we changed that was we started having them do ride alongs with um, say the um, the line crews for electrical utility, or we had them attend town halls with the call centers hmm. just so they could get a feeling for what was going on. <laughs> and we just encouraged this behavior. And what okay. happened was now they, they weren't busy just looking at the back end of a PC or a server and somebody gave them a problem with the organization. They're like, why don't you just do this? And they'd be like, I didn't know I could do that. My, my most famous um, illustration of this is uh, a level one technician just came out of community college. Okay. And he wanted to learn more about the company. Very curious individual. He went on a ride along with a line crew. You know, those people who fix your power lines through the town. Mm -hmm. He just rode with them for like two hours. Okay. He came back and he's like, they're still doing timesheets by hand. 
Like, well, we did a timesheet system. We built a timesheet system two years ago or three years ago. Um, why aren't they using that? And they're like, well, they don't have any internet in the in the truck, and their laptops are kind of like, they can't get on the hotspot. Doesn't really work well, so it's easier for them to come in on Fridays and fill out all their timesheets for an hour. So that's eight people on a crew filling out timesheets for an hour. He says, so I gave them one of our loner uh, hotspots, and they loved it. And I said, cool. What's the problem? Why don't we? He's like, well, it's really expensive to do a hotspot for all the crews. We have you know like sixty crews. I'm like, let me worry about that. So you're telling me the problem is they can't do their time sheets or aren't doing their time sheets. They're coming in. It's costing an hour. It's costing eight hours a week for each of these crews. And we can solve that just by getting a hotspot. And he says, yes. Okay, well, I'm going to talk to the directors and I'm going to, I'm going to get approval for this. Or I talked to the, I brought, I brought the, um, actually I brought the, uh, the, the problem up to the sea levels. I said, look, this is happening. Here's what's going to take to solve it. It costs $15,000. Are you okay with that? I'm like, oh, heck yeah. If it helps the crews, then let's do that. That identification of a problem, of a business problem and solution came from a level one tech straight out of a community college. Hmm. This was not a high level engineer who was thinking complex thoughts. They simply listened to the crews talk about one of their problems. And I started noticing that happening over and over again when I listened to my level one techs who are under the, under the seats, under the tables of these people every day. And I get them, hey, while you're out there, be a little curious, chit chat with the person. What do they do for a living? What are the problems they have in their company? And you're going to learn a lot. And then your engineering brain has a the ability to solve problems. You love solving problems. Like, why you're in this, this industry anyways? So when you hear somebody complain about something, you're immediately going to try to solve it. Bring that back to your MSP. Say, hey, I think they could probably benefit from this thing. Maybe VR, uh, better iPads, uh, more powerful laptops, whatever it is, because here's where they're struggling. Interesting. No, I, I agree with that. I 100% agree with that. Everyone, I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure you have because most people have when I ask, but I'm going to ask anyway. Have you ever watched the show IT Crowd? Oh, yeah. I think I've seen the whole season about four times through. Yeah, yeah. Hello, IT. <laughs> have you tried turning it off and on again? Yep. That's not really far off from the the reality that we're still living in in 2024, right? I mean, you know, I, I, my, my big struggle when it comes to, you know, all right, let's try it this way. You said the CEO is the CIO until they hire somebody else to do it, right? Okay. Do you take a tech and move them into that role? Or are you hiring somebody from outside of technology who may be, you know, a good people person and maybe not a great technology person? It's, it's, it's a bit of a, what are you expecting, expect, expecting? I have found that I can teach certain things. I can teach you how to fix a PC. I can teach you how, well, I used to be able to, now I'm just an old manager who doesn't know anything. Um, but you can teach technology skills pretty easily. And what I usually tell people is it's really easy to take an account manager style, like a TAM mm -hmm. and turn them into a CIO. They have both people skills and some technical skills. That's your ideal case. Somebody who's a TAM, they like going out for a beer with the, the customer. They are, they're gregarious. That's what you want as a CIO, but you also want an analytical mind. And so I tell people, like, yes, you could take a IT level one tech and turn them into a CIO with a little bit of training, just a little bit of coaching, if they're the right person. You can also take somebody who knows nothing about IT and turn them into a CIO with a little tech training. Let them sit down with the techs, let them sit down with the engineers and spend some time there. What a lot of consultants who are making a big bucks off of being CIOs will say is like, oh, it takes 20 years to become a CIO. If that was the case, then how did people become CIOs back in 2000 when there was no history? They did a great job, which is how we got to be where we are today. Sure. Now, I do have the caveat I say that now that we're 20 years, 25 years into the IT crowd, uh, into the IT field, we are starting to see people with 25 years of IT experience mm -hmm. where they understand the engineering mindset and have, we have weeded out the um, charlatans, the, uh, the, uh, the sociopaths, <laughs> and we have let the, the really good, um, 
really good engineers who are also social rise to the top. These people are becoming CIOs now and directors of IT, and they're really good at what they do because they are able to see the people side, the profit side, and the technical side all at the same time. Hmm. And those are are very, very good employees. The, the bad part happens when you have an engineer who never got that training and never got that understanding of what it means to be a leader in IT. And they get put into an IT role and they expect everybody to behave like them. They don't have any cultural awareness. That's where things get dangerous. They don't have any profit awareness. So you're running an MSP and you're not looking at your profit margins, you're not figuring out where you need to be going. That's dangerous. Hmm. Uh, you can't just work harder and make more money. And so that's, that's where that CIO mentality is. You have to have that business knowledge. And sometimes it's easier to teach the non-technical person to become a CIO. Sometimes it's easier to teach the technician to become a CIO. It all depends on the personality of the person. Okay. So let's rewind a little bit and try and put this into something you know chewable, right? Small company, not a lot of staff. How often are they doing account management in the course of a 12-month year? Like... Is that once a month, once a quarter, wait till the something blows up and they got to replace something? Like, what does that look like? Ideally. Mm -hmm. um, so we talk, we talk a lot about cadence in our, if you go to our YouTube channel, we get several videos on cadence. We talk about in our community all the time. And it depends on the size and needs of your client. Okay. So we call a class A client. There's somebody who's bringing in the most money for you. Say they're bringing in like 20,000 MRR or building a 10,000 MRR. So we're, going, we're sitting down and we're saying, how, how long do you want to wait till you find something's going wrong? A month? A quarter? Because a lot of these small businesses, they'll sit on a problem for a year. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll, they'll, because they'll, they're, they're scrappy, just like you. They're trying to just get their business going. They'll sit on a problem for a year. So on a, on a big client, you want to be meeting with them. Like say they have a lot of change coming through. You're looking at like once a month. I had clients I met with once a week. And because they're going through rapid change, we were we were bidding out a new process for them. But then as we moved through and got into more of our stride, we were meeting once a quarter to review where we are going, make sure we're still on track. Hey, here's what's coming up in the next quarter. What do we, are we still on track to do all this stuff? Is your business still doing well? Do we need to revise any of this? A quarterly business review is forward looking. Even though it says review, it is forward looking. What are you doing next? You're gonna talk about five minutes on what you did last quarter, but then you're gonna spend the next hour talking about where are you going? You're reviewing with the business what they're doing so they can tell you about the business so that you can adjust your strategy going forward. But for small clients, you know, there's not a lot of moving parts there. Mm -hmm. You might meet once a year via a phone call to say, hey, how's the hot dog stand doing? You guys selling a lot this year? Any major issues? You do anything new next year? Let's talk about it. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. That tracks. All right. So size of customer changes cadence. Could be weekly, could be monthly, could be quarterly, could be annually. Yep. But probably annually is the longest period. But I would not wait any longer than annually. Okay. Um, because what happens then is what if everything's going really well, right? You haven't been to the client in a long time. So we have something called a client engagement score. Mm -hmm. So if you're meeting with the client regularly, the score stays up here. You know, you brought them donuts. You gave them a phone call, say, how are things going? Hey, we're having a beer event. Hey, we're going to the MSB community mines. You want to come with us to the party? Mm -hmm. You know, you're doing things to keep that human relationship going. And if you meet once a year, you're giving 12 months for somebody else to come in and do a better job of maintaining that relationship than you. You might be doing just fine as a technician, but that relationship matters. And so you have to see your, your client as almost like you see your partners in life. If you were dating somebody and you waited a year to talk to them again, how's that relationship going to go? What about, you know, your family, some of your family members, you don't want, you don't talk to very often and that's fine because you know what, that, you do your touch base once at Christmas, and that's all you need. Some of your family members, you need to be seeing daily. You need to talk to them daily. You need to talk to them on how they're doing. You need to touch base with your kids. Same thing with your clients. Some of them you're going to want to meet yearly with. Some of them eventually you're going to fire because they're just not a good fit for your culture. And some of them you're going to want to meet with like weekly or monthly, depending on what's going on. That's fair. And then 
how much you know a lot of you know a lot of people have said it's not a new topic but it's worth since we're on it like hey when you come and meet with me i just expect you're going to ask me to buy something like this is more of a car dealership meeting in the sales office rather than a let's talk about you know other things meeting and it's like well if things are changing you know this is the counter right things are changing yeah. and we're trying to tell you you need to you know counter and address for those things most of the time that doesn't come without some sort of financial you know cost to it right like yep. if it doesn't it doesn't but unfortunately in technology land it usually does yep. how do you like you know mellow that you know that story a little bit so let's talk about red flags for a second. Mm -hmm. If your client starts talking about, you're always asking me for money. Ooh, that's a red flag, right? That should be flipping and flying in your face saying you're doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. Your, your client is seeing you are a best buy. Now, if I walk into best buy, I know I'm going to get a terrible price on technology. We all know they charge freaking too much money for a cable, but sometimes you're desperate and you just need to get something. Like, I need a laptop because I'm flying out for a conference tomorrow. Right. That's how I got my last laptop. <laughs> you know? I walked in, gave him a credit card, and I walked out. Are you a Best Buy? Are you just somewhere where we see cash registers? Or are you a consultant? Are you coming in with advice? Are you being invited to meetings? Hey, we'd really like to have George come to this meeting because we need, his, we need him to think about this stuff. So to stop being... Told like, ugh, why? If you ask yourself the question, why don't my clients listen to me? That's another red flag. If you're asking yourself that question, giant red flag. Just as if a client were to say, you always ask, you always want me to spend money. If they, if you are starting to ask yourself, why isn't my client listen to me? That's a red flag saying you aren't listening to your client enough. You aren't asking them questions about what's going on in their business, and so they're complaining about other things. So, and they're not going to listen to you when you come talk to them about stuff because you're disconnected from their bottom line. Mm -hmm. When you pitch a server, a firewall, a technology solution, and you don't understand how that's going to affect their profit margins or their priorities for this quarter, that's why they're not buying. And you're trying to convince them about security. You're trying to convince them about principles. You're trying to convince them about best practices. And the back of their mind, they're thinking, I need to make payroll at the end of this month. I've got a huge community event coming up where I've got to make sure our product gets out to market and you want me to install a firewall. It's working just fine. It's not affecting the way I'm delivering my product. So you can say, Hey, look, you've got a big event coming up next month. Your firewall has been throwing 60 errors a day. If we don't get this replaced before that big event, you might disrupt that event. I would like to get this replaced before the end of July so that we can make sure that everything's smooth next month. Now you have their their attention. That's fair. That's fair. How much information is too much information? Meaning like people tend to just not read things, right? Like you can send as much, you know, you can send information, you can send updates, you can send newsletters, you can send uh, one sentence email. I don't know, but like bottom line is in between those meetings, how do you effectively communicate? Because the technology land, let's face it, it, it's it's not exactly like uneventful, right? I mean, I feel like every other day, every other week, something's going down. And like, whether it's Microsoft or Amazon or CrowdStrike or whatever, right? Something's happening. And again, that, that's that relationship component. And a lot of the channel vendors will try to get you to, oh, look, we'll automate this report so you can send it to your client. And we'll, we'll help you with these, these alerts. Alert fatigue has been identified as a problem since I was a tier one tech. Like people would click okay on alerts and they didn't even know they did it. Mm -hmm. Today you have so many reports, so much noise going to your clients because this is good information. I should send this to them too. And so you got these giant portals that get built. Like the client should want to know this information. No, it's like QuickBooks. I use like three things in QuickBooks on a, on a weekly basis. Great invoice. Does it do a ton of things for me? <laughs> yes. I'm doing payroll. I'm doing my P&L report and I'm attaching receipts when I remember. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, what else is it? A thousand things. Do I want to report on all those things? Oh, <laughs> 
It's just going to go into the waste paper basket. So you have to decide what do you want your client to know? And so our rule of thumb is if you, too much information, if you're in a meeting with a client and you mention firewall, like a QBR, you should probably be fired. It's too much information. They don't care what a firewall is. They really, really until, don't. Until it breaks. What, they care that the internet is up. Yeah. If you hear somebody talk about what's the internet, the internet starts at your PC. Mm -hmm. So if you want to get into a technical argument, the internet starts at your PC. And it goes up to the Wi-Fi. Then it goes up to the internet router. And so you got AOT, you got your AOT 11, you got your full stack going up to your layer seven firewall, which is kicking out to an upstream router. And so people say the internet's down. Okay. Well, you as a technician are like, okay, which part of it? <laughs> and it's your job. And you're going to assume router or you're going to assume the Wi-Fi, and you're going to go figure it out. You have to translate what they're saying. They don't care what a Wi-Fi router is. They don't care what a firewall is. They don't know the difference between the two. All they know is that their connectivity to ESPN.com is not working. And so it when you're talking to your clients, that. remember that. Yeah. I was going to say it's an important time of year for ESPN.com, all that fantasy football going on. Uh, uh, Masters tournament uh, is responsible for one of my biggest upgrades to a pipeline ever. Really? Yeah. The the uh, the C level offices could not stream the Masters tournament in huh. HD. This was back when live streaming online just was first out. And we said, well, it's because our pipe isn't big enough. And they said, how much is it going to cost? And we said, like, something like 60000 a month. All right, we're done. Do it. 60000 a month? What kind of internet are we talking here? Welcome to corporate, man. Oh, <laughs> dude. It's like multiple fiber lines bonding <laughs> from different carriers on some crazy, like, high availability. Thing. Oh, you don't just – it's not a matter of just plugging in one line, man. If you're If you worked at the corporate level ever – Especially at the the large corporate level, it's it's a to do. Sixty thousand dollars upgrade the internet. Uh, I don't remember what the the actual number was, but it was it was significant around there. So, yeah, I'd be but like, they knew that they were growing as a company, and was, this was just the first red flag I, yeah. that tipped them off that so, they. So need why was it? Why wasn't the why wasn't the pitch? Hey, we can just bring in Directv and plug it right into the side, put the satellite out the window, call it a day. That's not cool. They got the job done. We had already had the project pitched to them. Okay. Uh, this just fast tracked it. I understand. You sure you surely got two birds with one stone on that one. Yeah. That is funny. Um where do you see things going here? Like in generally in MSP land, right? Like, you know. A lot of money still out there. A lot of big mega MSPs have been formed, right? A lot of you know, mergers and acquisitions have happened. But like you, a lot of people were in corporate America. And I argue, and I challenge anyone listening to this, by the way, go back to 2020 and then 21, 22, 23, and 24 and add up all of the layoff announcements in technology since that time till now. We've lost more jobs in the tech industry than we've added. And you, I mean, you can argue with me, I bring your receipts, but I would say I've not seen so-and-so companies adding 10,000 new jobs. I just see cutting, 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 and they've been cutting since 2020. Okay. So like, what does that mean? Does that mean that there's more people like Adam who were in corporate America set up, you know, Hey, my own IT for shop consulting, whatever, because, you know, I got laid off from a big company or is it shrinking? Is it going the other way? You know, it's it's technology. Um, the the it's like look at the automotive industry. Look at historical industries that have matured when it comes to technology. The the low end is will always be streamlined and commoditized. Yeah. Eventually, PCs will not be something you support anymore. They'll be something that are bought and tossed away like phones. You will Fair. manage the software, and that's it from a, a central console. You don't have to really troubleshoot them very often. And, and that's because we're, we're just maturing as an industry. Mm -hmm. What is doing really well is consultative practices, CIO level, fractional CIO, helping companies understand how to make money with technology. We're seeing a ton of MSPs, especially small MSPs, making a killing, like 80% margin on, um, on compliance as a service. If you're a 10-man shop and you're sitting there thinking, 
okay, we want to get out of break fix. We want to get into something that's going to make us some money. Com <laughs> compliance as a service people is where it's at. Eventually all these insurance providers are going to start requiring that these mid-sized companies have SOC 2 compliance or something similar. They're going to make that red tape. And these mid-sized companies, these small companies are going to ask, who's going to help me with this? Right now, they're going to look to CPAs to help with their SOC 2. They're going to look to another industry. They should be looking to you. And if you don't get on this compliance as a service bandwagon, it's going to be just like as if you didn't adopt the cloud back in 2010. It's going to be like really? if you didn't do VMware in 2005. Wow. It's going to be like if you did not move into um, Active Directory in 2000. It's a pretty, it's a pretty bold statement. It, it's what we're seeing. Yeah, I mean, but SOC 2 is not a small effort. I mean, like, there's an entire sub-industry that came out just to support SOC 2. And that's just one framework, right? Well, we're also seeing a bunch of independent vendors come up, like uh, Compliance Scorecard. Big shout out to Tim Golden there. Uh, building tools that allow MSPs to do compliance as a service easily. We integrate with them at Humanize IT because we know it's that important. When you're doing a QBR, when you're when you're automating your QBRs, there should be a module in there that says, here's how compliant you are with CMMC. Here's how compliant you are with SOC 2. And it's not just a checklist. It's a big industry. So we plug into Compliance Scorecard so that you can get a snapshot of that during your QBR. And then when somebody says, hey, uh, why, are we, why do we have so many at-risk items there? I'm like, well, we need to set up another um, meeting to talk about compliance, which you're paying for right now. Or if you're not paying for it, hey, if you really want to talk about all these at-risk items over here, then you need to engage us in our compliance as a service so that we can get that done. And we'll have separate meeting for that because it is a big item. But it also, the margins are huge in it. It's not installing a server where you're getting a 20 to 10% margin. On compliance and service, it's all consultative. That's fair. If you're charging for your time properly. Yeah. The, and that's where anything. If if you're giving away consult <laughs> compliance as a service for free, you got you got bigger issues. And again, that comes to the engineer who thinks that they can just work harder and make more money. You got to have that business component to your mind. You have to have somebody who can help teach you how to be better, how to think like a businessman. That's that's fair. So I'm that's by the way that is the line of this episode. If you're not doing compliance as a service, that was like, and you gave me so many examples, right? Like basically, like you're doing it wrong. Yep, you're 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 going to turn into a Best Buy here in about five years. You'll you'll be and we all have seen it. Microsoft's undercutting you. Dell's undercutting you. Lenovo's undercutting you. They're going direct to consumer. You can see it happening. If you don't see it happening, watch Reddit. People are complaining about it all the time, about how the Microsoft uh, resellers are hitting their companies directly and undercutting their value. Hmm. And so that is going to continue to happen with every piece of technology out there. You know what they can't do? They can't do compliance as a service. They can't consult with the company the way you can. You know your local area. You know your town. You know your people. And when you build that relationship, you can keep that going. And there's no Microsoft, Lenovo, or MDM provider that is going to undercut you because you have the relationship with them. That's fair. That's fair. I feel like that only scales to a certain point, though. Correct. But the like margin is big enough that it doesn't matter. I'd rather have 10 clients with 80% margin than 20 clients with 20% margin. No, the, that math tracks 100%. <laughs> that math tracks all the time. Uh, as long as you know, again, um, as much as if you're not in the compliance business, you seem you're in trouble, it sounds like, but you, you better know your numbers too, right? Like in order to understand what's profitable, yep, you need to understand how you make money, right? Yeah, you have to understand how, your money, how are you going to make money five years from now? And that's why I say, Move into consultative. That's why we at Humanize IT really double down on the fact that you need to consult. People ask us, do you do warranty lookups? No, we do depreciation because that's what the CIO cares about. Yeah. Do you do do you do this? Do you do asset management? No, because the client doesn't care about that. What they actually care about is are you helping them make money? Are you helping them get a competitive edge over their competitors in the marketplace? Are you making their jobs easier? 
These are things that you need to be working on. If you're not working on those, you are falling behind. 100%. Now, I, I, I track with all that. So that's interesting. So Humanize IT is a coaching company that happened to have built some software to help with that process. Yes. Got it. With client okay. delivery. Okay. And as an MSP, your- do I pay for coaching uh, as a, like a subscription model or yep. do I do it an hour? We're, mo- or- we're month to month. Cancel anytime. You get our tool. We'll help you find revenue with our tool automatically. You can build your stack in there. We'll automatically look at your PSA and look for uh, look for gaps and white space for you. So okay. your account manager doesn't have to be highly technical. They just click a button and here's all your projects. So, but then in the meantime, we are always helping you learn. So the first six weeks, we're working with you one-on-one, either in block sessions or once a week or when you want to, to learn about how to segment out your clients. How often should you be meeting with those class A's? How often should you be in class D's? How do you generate more revenue through better relationships? Those are things we're teaching you. And we happen to have a tool that plugs into your PSA so you can present what you're doing to your client. So you can spend more time listening from them. You can build a QBR in our software in like six minutes. Found it takes you to log in, click sync. Because really a QBR, an effective QBR, to go back to an early question in this, in this webinar, you can build an effective QBR with zero prep. You need a pencil and a piece of paper because your job is to listen to the client about what's going on in their business. That's your primary focus. 90% of your meetings should be listening to them about what's going on so you can take those problems back to your engineering team and solve them and say, hey, look, we've got a great way for you to make more money. I love that message. I think everybody can understand that. That's plain English. It's not techno, you know, techno babble where they don't know what you're talking about. I made $36,000 MRR as a two-man shop doing just consulting. I love that. I did that for years. That's how I was able to buy a software company to convert into what I wanted. You as a 10-man company or 10-person company, how much could you make if you did more consultative processes? I, I feel like the consulting thing has kind of gotten buried in the, hey, well, managed services has to be done as this bundled thing, and you just all need to go this one way. Because that makes the channel money. It doesn't make the MSP money. So all the marketing is around, hey, resell this, resell this, resell this. Here's a marketing strategy to resell this. This is a $300 billion industry to resell. And they've turned MSPs into resellers. So it's easy because I know that if I sell this license, I'm going to make 20 cents on the dollar or 20 cents on per license. And if I sell more of these, I'm going to win. But what you don't know is that's not your license. That is Microsoft's license. And they're eventually going to undercut you when those margins get down to 10 cents because it's no longer worth having you as the middleman. But consulting, consulting will never be undercut. Consulting is something you can do via compliance as a service, via a CIO uh, consulting practice or whatever. And you can do it as part of your practice and it will generate revenue for you because now you're selling projects that your client wants to buy. Fair. So we listen to the client, we create projects based on what we listen to, and then they pay you at 80% profit margin for the work. Yep. I love that. Why isn't everybody- Outsource the work to somebody else. <laughs> I was going to say, why isn't everybody- Use IT doing... by design. Send the, send the work to them and you just go out and consult. Okay. I think what, you know, for everybody who's you know been trying to you know just win the rat race, Maybe you need to do a you know, business model shift, sounds like. Get out of the rat race and go. We were consultants in the late 90s. Our job in the late 90s was, hey, um, I heard about this World Wide Web thing. How do I get my inventory out there so people can peruse it? Because I saw the car dealership down the street did that. Mm-hmm. I don't know how to do it. So suddenly we became HTML experts. Uh, I mean, prove me wrong here. Talk to anybody who lived through the dot com. Like anybody who was in through.com knew HTML because that was the biggest problem. We knew how to build PCs because you could order it from Dell and Gateway, but was it cheaper? It was cheaper to build a white box and deliver it and then offer your own warranty for that back then. And then eventually Dell and Gateway undercut us all with HP and we didn't build white boxes anymore. No one builds white boxes unless it's for a specific use, like a gaming machine or a high-end machine for a workstation. Even then, you still go to the manufacturer. Eventually, every technology thing you have is going to go that direction. 
but your consulting will always be there. People will always need to know how to accomplish technology in their business. That's fair. Where do people find more information about you, your company, your community, your YouTube, your podcast, all that good stuff? Definitely. You can go to humanizeit.biz. You can check us out on social media. We are on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Spotify, Apple. You check us out. You Google hey, Humanize IT, you'll find us. Look for the unicorn. Um, we'll be at MSP Community Minds next week. It'll be our our, our first uh, time there. So find me. I was thinking about putting up a poster that says, I will talk about d and I'll talk about... Uh, um, fantasy novels. I'll talk about hunting and fishing, and I'll talk about QBRs. You're you're gonna you're gonna fit into that crowd perfectly because the whole point of Community Minds is just let's take down all of the you know superficial conference stuff and let's just talk about things that work and don't work. And you know you walk away with a lot of good information because nobody's trying to sell. Like I'm not trying to pitch you to go to this thing to swipe your credit card to go to eight sessions later to then figure out. You know what I mean? Like. You, you know, we're all sharing. And if you want to learn more, everybody just exchanges their information. Right. And then like afterwards, you go where you go. Right. But yep. it's amazing what happens when you put everybody in the room that has that mindset. And then all of a sudden, like the juices get flowing and people let their guard down a little bit. And then all of a sudden, like real conversations happening rather than just the surface level stuff. Building relationships. Relationships matter. No matter what industry you're in, relationships matter. I think you I think you'll love it. So looking forward to seeing you in Denver next week, guys. I, you know, I hope, I know there's like 18,000 events, I, probably closer to three to 500 events a year. I know like you got your businesses to run in, by the way, Adam, if you, you know, my percentage, you can, if you want to, you know, contest it, I'm sure you will next week when you see me in person, is that only 8% of the hundred percent of IT companies, MSP companies um, that could go to an event, only 8% make it to one in a 12 month period. So okay. 92 never make it they stay at home i'm planning on uh next year really heavily investing not in conferences as a vendor but rather in building a community of webinars that actually mean something to people so you don't get to travel you should still be able to get this great education and i'm not planning on making any money off of it i plan on doing this because it's the right thing to do it's the right direction to go i love that's great that's great the question is let's make sure people actually learn about it and show up because if you don't show up and you don't learn, what are we doing? Craziness, right? I uh, hope everybody um, goes back and rewatches this one. Go to check out Human Eyes IT. Check out MSP Community Minds. We're going to be pumping a lot of content after after next week because it's just going to be a week of content, really, between a couple of different things going on in Denver. Uh, Adam, can't wait to meet you in person again, and uh, we'll we'll talk shop because you know you're good at that, and I'll throw a little bit of Philly flair in there when I get a chance. Um, for everyone else, this session will be on MSPinitiative.com under sessions will be on YouTube and Facebook and LinkedIn and your podcatcher and like go back and, and then check out human eyes IT's podcast as well. Sounds like they got a good series coming and they're doing some good stuff. So check that out. Um, 215 think, episodes. Beautiful. I love that. It's great. It's a lot of content. Uh, I think because we are in Denver next week, I'll double check with Jen. If we're going to be doing sessions Tuesday, Thursdays, Thursdays next week, like we do mostly every week. If not, stay tuned. We'll post the schedule for next week online. And for everyone else, hey, there's all the big conferences are just seem to be jammed into like, I don't know, a three month period. So hopefully we'll see at one of the ones that we talked about in the beginning. Catch you on the flip side. Take it easy, Adam. Hey, thank you. Have a great day. And you too.